asked for to go over something. So I made a little um, mini application. I just adapted the coins application to go over um, what the question was. I hope this answers the question. If not, we can go from there and discuss it. In a nutshell, the question was creating views dynamically. If you recall, um, the way I did my coins application and the way I suggested you could do for the first pass, I said a couple of things. I said, number one, you could just hard code the views. Or you could hard code the number of rows and then have everything a multiple of four so that you, um, you know, could add, uh, you know, just show and hide the number of rows. Similar to what they did in, in the flag case. In the flag case, they had four rows, each containing two buttons. And depending on how, what your options were set for, you could pick two, four, six, or eight, and it would just show or hide the, the number of rows. So if you pick two, it would show one row. If you picked eight, it would show all four rows. So um, as we know, you know, that's not bad. That, that gets the job done, and it sort of makes sense given that regular, you know, uh, we would want the grid to be regular, and multiples of four is a reasonable thing to do for both the card game and for the flag game. Actually, the flag game is multiples of two, and the card game I suggested multiples of four. But there might be times where you want to be more dynamic in what you're doing. Uh, you might want to uh, create um, the interface programmatically as opposed to um, having hard-coded in the XML. So that's what I did. And you could, again, you could do this a couple different ways. Let me, let me tell you the way that I did it. Um, I have a rows and columns variable in my uh, activity for coins. I then have a rows and columns XML file. So I have uh, uh, the, the row XML file is called row, the column XML file is called image because I'm showing a certain number of images per row. I then have my fragment XML which only consists of a linear layout. So let me write sort of the pseudocode on the board for what I'm doing and we can look at the actual code. I have a rows variable and a calls variable. I think I made them constants. Doesn't mean it have to be constants. Um, and I have them set to a certain value. Doesn't matter what the value is. On create view for the activity, I'm sorry, for the, for the fragment. I also have two XML files. I have my fragment, actually three that's relevant here. I have my fragment XML that consists only of a linear layout, which is oriented vertically. I then have a row XML, which is a linear layout that is oriented horizontally. And finally, I have an image layout, which is oriented, well, it isn't oriented, it's an image view. Just a simple image view. So what I do is on the onCreate view, I essentially have two loops. Four, four. So nested four. This one's going to go for i equals zero, i less than the number of rows, i plus plus. This one's going to go for int j equals zero, j is less than columns, j plus plus. It's interesting, I've, I've had students ask me, not that you, anyone would care, why I always use i and j for integer rows. 
uh, for, for, uh, for row counters and all that. And it gets back to my early learning in Fortran. And in Fortran, I'm pretty sure the rules of the language, maybe it was just a practice, I don't even know for sure, but variable names that started with I through N were integers. Everything else was something else, all right? So I just got used to making integers I through I and J, or N53, I, J, K, and so on. So a little fascinating bit of trivia there for you. All right. So I actually should have put a little space in here. Here, I create a linear layout by, well, I actually have three inflates here. I inflate the fragment XML to create the view for the fragment. And that's just the one linear layout. Remember, the way they did it, I sort of emulated what they did in the Deedal example. Uh, this is included in a bigger layout. So I inflated that fragment XML to make that. All right? I then have a loop. For each iteration through the loop, I inflate my row XML, and then I add the row to the main view. I then have my inner loop that creates the columns. And I inflate the image view, the image XML rather, to create my image view. I add that image view to the row. And then I do all the things that I did before. If you remember, I had parallel arrays between the uh, between my coin objects and my uh, image views. So I still have my image, image list of, or, or array list of image views. I still have my array list of coins. The only difference is instead of hard-coded and pointing to them, I'm actually programmatically creating them using those two XMLs, all right? When I'm done, everything works the same, except that um, it's, it's, it's truly dynamic, all right? It's not hard-coded in any way. Questions about this general conceptual approach? Let's look at the specific code. That we XML files that, like the flag example, have. I have my activity main one, which contains a content main include file. That content main uh, uh, include file contains a fragment. All right. Here's my fragment, which is just my linear layout, because that's what I'm going to put as my container where I'm going to put stuff in. I then have a row which is also a linear layout, oriented horizontally, and then finally I have an image view, which is um, simply the image. Everything works the same until I get to the fragment and my on create view. This code was in the uh, original example. So that's copied from the uh, Dito example, the flag example, with one itty bitty difference. And I take advantage of this difference. I cast it as a linear layout. All right. I know that this fragment main, again, since I wrote the fragment main, 
I know that it consists of a linear layout, so therefore I can cast it as a linear layout. That allows me to uh, treat it like a linear layout. What's the significance of that? Um, I can add views to a linear layout. A linear layout is a view group, all right? And I can add views to a view group. So a view group is a um, subclass of, of a view, and it's a view that you can essentially add other views to. You can group views together. So it is a view, but it's also a view group, which means I can add stuff to it. So the one difference I do here is I cast it as a linear layout. All right, here's my four loops. And I use my inflator to inflate my row XML layout. I actually don't need this here. That was a leftover from a previous example, or a previous attempt, rather. But I do cast the view again as a linear layout. Because remember, this is each row. Each row I want to be a view group because I want to be able to add views to the row. All right? And if it's just a view, I can't add rows, or I'm sorry, I can't add images to the view. It has to be a view group, of which linear layout is one of them. So what this does is this inflates my row XML and adds it to my fragment linear layout. How is it adding it to the fragment? Is it in that line? This is this line. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Now, this is one thing I learned. It's sort of a quirk of this inflate. This can either be a a true or false, it's a boolean to attach to root. The return value actually depends on whether that's true or false. All right, this is something that was a little tricky. If that is set to false, this inflate will return whatever it inflated from this XML layout. So in this case, it's going to return a pointer to this row if that's set to false. If it's set to true, notice the name of the parameter is attached to root. If I say true, it will take whatever this view is, all right, and it will add this view automatically to this view. That's what the attach means. The problem is, is the return value will be the combined of the combination of the two views. And I don't want that. I just want the new row that I inserted. All right? Does that make sense? I'll take your word for it. Okay. <laughs> right. You said it was strange. So. Yeah. The strangeness of it is I would expect, I would expect this function to always return the view that I inflated. If I add it to another view, though, automatically, it doesn't return the view that I inflated. It returns a combination of the view that I just inflated plus the view that I added that view to. So you get your main fragment. You get the main fragment and the new, the, the new row attached to it. And that didn't work. Uh, I, you know, because in theory, if that worked the way I would expect it to, I wouldn't need this line of code because it would have automatically added it in. But now this new row view is just the new row because I set that to false. So I want to go and add that row view to my main fragment view. So now I've added a row to the main fragment. Now. I then have a for loop that says for j equals 0, j is less than columns, j plus plus. I essentially do the same thing with the image view. I grab my image view by inflating the 
the image layout, row view, and I don't attach it to the row. Again, the same sort of thing happens. So I get back the image view. I then go and add that new image that I just inflated to the row that I created up here. The rest of it is more or less the stuff that I had hid here before, <clears throat> where I add the corresponding coin to the coin array list. I add this image view to my image view array list. I call the set image function, whereas the number of this image is equal to uh, whatever the variable i is times columns plus j. All right, so. That simply takes the row and column and maps it into a number. So if I have a 4x4 four four array uh, of images, it will map uh, the first image. First, row 0, column 0 will be image 0. Row 0, column 1 will be uh, image 1, and so on through image 15. And then for that image, I set the on-click listener. And then I'm back in business. I'm good to go. The rest of the code stays the same. So to run this, I had said I wanted six rows, four columns. So sure enough, I have six rows, four columns. And as I delete, as I click to, to get rid of it, it makes it disappear. Let me demonstrate some of the problems that I had. If, for example, this is one that was a good one. I was thinking, oh, I don't need this instruction. And so I commented that out and made this true. If I make that true, I die. All right. Why did I die? Because scroll up here. Layout cannot be cast to an image layout. Because remember, as I said before, if I say attach to root true. This doesn't return the image that inflates. It returns the combination of the image that it inflated and the view that it added it to. So it's actually returning row view in that case and not image view. All right? It's returning the row that I added it to, not the image view itself, which seems weird to me, but that's how it works. All right? And since row view is a um, linear layout, it can't take and cast a linear layout as an image view. So that was one problem that I had. That one was probably the most puzzling of all of them because I stared at that for a while and I sort of understood what that attached to root meant, all right, and I thought I did anyhow. And as it turns out, I kind of did, but I missed the important fact of that when you attach the root, you get back a different return value. You don't get back the new view that was created. 
Now, when I did, there was more subtle air up here. If I did this, then crashes to and I'm not sure it's the same sort of thing that's different than what I remembered I remembered it worked it just didn't display right so Bottom line is, both of those had to be false and I had to manually add it. On. Now it should work. Actually, it did sort of work. It just added a bunch of tiny coins to the vertically oriented <laughs> uh, to the vertically oriented um, original linear layout instead of the linear layout I collected. Questions about this? Oh, the one thing was when I didn't cast it as a linear layout, I got to compile on that because you can't add a view to a view. You can only add a view to a view group. So I had to cast it as a linear layout, which is okay because that's what it is. So I should be able to cast it as that. Of course, as we find out, if it happens not to be like that at, at runtime, it, the, comp the, the runtime engine is going to be very angry at us if it happened to not be a linear layout or not being able to cast to a linear layout. Does that sort of help with the issues you were having? Oh, yeah, definitely. Thank you so okay. much. I, as I was driving over, I thought, you know what, I'm making this way too complicated and I'm going to okay. punt. 62 image views and I don't care. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but now I have something to play with. All right, good.
I appreciate questions like this because it's nice because I think I think I can write little examples like this to kind of show you what it is abstracted from like a million other things that's going on in the bigger apps. Any other questions or comments about this? The, the folks that were not here Thursday missed a couple of outstanding memory games. So maybe we'll have a chance to look at this um, also. I did kind of have a question too. Uh, there's supposed to be a final exam in this course. I don't normally, I don't give final exams in a lot of my courses, um, but I usually either give final exams or projects. I guess I have the question of, would you guys, what are your guys' feelings on instead of having a final exam of having a final project? It would still be called the exam, but the exam would be maybe the last three or four weeks project, just like we've done this for like the last three weeks, so we'd have sort of a bigger project. Opinions on that? Yay, nay? I like the, how you split it out. Okay. Um, by a few weeks. Okay. A lot. This is really complicated stuff. For, right. for me, at least. Um, I think it is for anyone. I really do. It's. I wouldn't know what to study for a written exam. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Well, it, that, that answer is easy. Everything that we talked about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay. All right. I'll, I'll consider it. Uh, I want to be fair to everyone. You know, um, exams are tough because, well, there are cases. I was actually just reminiscing about uh, a case I, uh, a, a project I had back in the old days where my company actually was filing Chapter 11 and we were under court orders to produce reports for a certain day. Now those are deadlines, right? Because <laughs> someone's going to jail if they don't have uh, have the report in time. But a lot of times with programming, it is more open ended. You don't necessarily have a timed, like, do this within an hour. It's more like, well, here's this. You have a certain amount of time to get it done. So I'll give that some thought, um, and maybe we'll do that over the last few weeks, including the finals. All right. The anyone else have questions or comments about this? The next, if not, what I want to at least start today is the address book, which the big deal with this is it uses a database. We have, I'm not crazy about this UI, but we start with a blank page, essentially, with a little plus sign on it. And the plus sign is meant to represent that you click that to add a new content in your address book. So you do that, we can go into the fields, and we can type in the name and other information. So we can type all that in. When we're done, we hit save. And then that shows up in there. If we click on this, we can go and edit it. Save it again. save it and delete it. 
All right. So real, as simple as a com database operation. Let's look at what we have here because we're going to have some different things. Drawable. Let's see. What's that? We have a vector. I believe that is for the plus. The delete's a little garbage can. The edit's a little pencil. Icon for save is a little desk. And then we have the border. So we have some drawables in there. Layout. Again, we have sort of the same thing where we have the activity main. That includes this layout, and we have two different content mains with resource qualifiers. The second of which puts the fragments side by side. We then have three fragments. We have the list of fragments. We have the detail of the fragment. And then we have the edit mode for the fragment. And well, that's the activity main. We looked at that already. So let's run this on a bigger screen. So let's pick instead this one. So notice as we type in, on the bigger version, as we save, the two things are side by side. Very similar to what we had in the, what was it, the flag game, right? Where we had, uh, depending on the size of the monitor, we had, um, uh, monitor, geez, boy. Uh, um, depending on the size of the screen of the device, we either had one fragment or we had two fragments. So in the flag one, we had the settings and the game. Here we have the list and this side by side. All right. So sort of takes advantage of it. And I really think these things are, uh, are nice touches, if, if that makes sense, right? Because I've done a little, you know, I've, I've done work on tablets and I've done work on phones. And it's kind of weird when you see an application that is written originally for a phone and it just is on your tablet and does not come near to taking up or make, making use of the advantage of the space that's available on the tablet. So I think this is a good example of a way that you can take advantage of it simply by using the resource qualifiers. The nice thing is, is you, this is done with a minimal amount of programming. It's not like you have to write tons of code. The resource qualifiers click, it, uh, click in all right, automatically when you get a device that meets that criteria. And then there's a little bit of code that you write here and there to see if one activity is showing or both activities or so on. All right, so that's kind of how it works. Those are the layout files. We talked about the drawables. We talked about the menu. Uh, edit and delete for the menu. There's our launcher icons. There are our values. Nothing earth shattering. Different style for version 21 and greater of Android. Let's look at the Java classes. Now, we have a data folder that contains information concerning the database. Let's go and identify all these classes first 
and then we'll look at them in more detail. We have our main activity. We have the list fragment, the contacts fragment, that is the list. We have the details fragment, that is when we're reading it in read-only mode. We have the add edit fragment, that is where we are editing it. So if I was going to say this is the contacts fragment over here, the list of contacts. This is the details fragment. When we go into edit mode, that is the add edit fragment, because that's what we get if we're adding or editing it. So that is this, 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 and this. All right. We have an item divider, which just sort of cracks me up that we have to we have a class simply to put a little item, a little line between items. But hey, what the heck? We then have a contact adapter, contacts adapter. What fragment do you think the contacts adapter is associated with? Yeah, probably the contacts one. I mean, we get that from the name, but. When have we seen adapters before? With a recycler view. So a recycler view, simply put, is a kind of list, right? So it would make sense that this would go with the part of the application that was a list. So in fact, if we look at the contacts fragment, uh, we are going to notice that, sure enough, there is the adapter associated with it, and if we look at the XML file for it, there's our friend, the recycler view. All right. In addition, we have the floating action button for the plus sign. So yeah, the adapters go with um, the contacts fragment. They're, they're, the, the University of Akron course that I'm teaching now in Java, um, as you know, fairly recently we, we have a, a partnership with uh, University of Akron for bachelors in software uh, development and web development, at least for now. Uh, but um, we're just talking about in our Java class uh, design patterns. And that's an interesting topic. Uh, design uh, design patterns and the adapter is one of the design uh, patterns that is used. In other words, the idea of a design pattern is that is been observed that there are certain situations. I guess is the best way to put it within a lot of different applications. Certain patterns sort of emerge. There are certain things that. Uh, you do in a lot of applications. So you think in terms of patterns. The idea of this is to sort of take uh, software development and make it a little more systematic and a little less, uh, a little less, uh, how would I say this? A little less a crafted, every solution is brand new to the problem and a little more in terms of we're going to use components and we're going to use ideas that we've used before that we know worked. And the adapter is one of the design patterns. And essentially the idea is, is that you use an adapter to, to connect two things, right? Like you'd use an adapter here, right? This needs to go to there, but this isn't the right plug for there. So there is an adapter that says, hey, let this work with that. That's really essentially what an adapter performs. We have a recycler view. We have a list. That list could come from a database. That list could be a hard-coded array list. That list could come from shared preferences, whatever. If we can make it so that we have an adapter to sort of take data wherever it comes from and put it in the format where a recycler view could use it, then we have an adapter. And we can then hook up a recycle view to a variety of different sources of data. All right, the interesting one, the one that we're going to start out with, is the database 
classes. And notice they're in a separate package, the data package. Let's start looking at the, see, what order do I want to go in? Let's start at the database description class. The, beta, the database description class essentially gives information about the database that we're going to use. We're using, in this case, a SQLite database. Okay? And we can store those on our Android device. Is that we have to use SQLite? Uh, do we have to use SQLite? I'm just looking that up. There are alternatives to SQLite for other databases. No. Oh. We noticed a lot of questions around databases and that not many people were aware of SQL alternatives. <laughs> All right, there we go. SQLite is embedded within um, Android, but again, um, there, all, there are alternatives as well. Okay. This sort of identifies the information about the database. Content provider's name typically is going to be the package name. Base URL used to interact with the content provider. And that's going to be a URL that contains content, colon, slash, slash, and the name of the package. We then have a nested class for the contact table. We have a table name, and that is contacts. We have the URI for accessing that contacts table. So this is how we access the contacts table. This is a list of all the columns, the data type, and the column name. And this is the lookup for a specific column. All right? This is the URI we get to get the list of contacts. This is the one that we use to get a specific contact. Essentially, this is describing the contents of our database. We then have a database helper. And it extends the SQLite helper. We give a database name, which is addressbook.db. And we give a database version of one. This is something that's kind of cool for this, because a problem that you run into with um, updating the database is if you release a new version of the application, of your application, you may have made some database changes. 
you may have added a column. You may have added a table. You may have deleted a column. You may have made any number of different changes. Well, if someone has the initial version of your database, and they go to install the new version of your application, in which you've made database changes, they're going to want to have their database upgraded. They don't want their database simply to be deleted and start over from scratch. So therefore, you can put associated with your database a version number. And what you can do is if someone runs an application and their database has a different version than your application does, there's code that can be written to do the conversion for you. And that code right here is in the onUpgrade method. The onUpgrade method takes a SQLite database, the old version and the new version, and you can put code in there to say, if they are coming from version 1 to version 2, add this table, add this column, delete this column, whatever you need to do. So this on upgrade function is, we won't use an example of it in this class, but it's a good place, it's a hook for you to put your database changes between versions of your application. So if your database changes between versions, you can put code in there. And when someone upgrades their applications, their database will also get upgraded. Otherwise, you'd be running a new application up against an old database. You might have stuff missing. You might have stuff that's not used, whatever. All right? Now, the very first time we run this, the database gets created. So we try to open the database. If the database doesn't exist, we create it. And in this case, we see what we have created. We've created a database table in our database that has a name of the table name and has these different columns. It gets those again from the database description. So it gets the table name. It gets the different column names and it actually creates a SQLite database to have those things. Last but not least is our content provider. Our content provider is what we're going to hook to our Well, we're going to hook to our uh, contacts adapter. And in this case, this shows code that we can use to e easily access stuff from the database. We can do a query. Notice that we have a query that we can look for one thing in the table, or we can look for a list of all of them. Notice when we're looking for one thing, we append a WHERE clause on to the SQL statement. Whereas if we're looking for all of them, we don't append a WHERE clause, so we get everything. We then get a cursor which is like an array, like a list that you can read through of all the things that match the criteria. We then have inserts, updates, and deletes that we can run. So this content provider is sort of the code that accesses the database for us and does the manipulation of this stuff. These three things work together to give us database access for SQLite.
Next time we'll look at this application in more detail and revisit these to see exactly what role they perform. I'm also open to answering any questions that you have concerning your assignments that you're working on. Uh, that was excellent that you emailed me that today because that, that gave me time to go in and create a quick example that I can use. It's nice. Um, I have to say I'm less experienced with Android development than I am other software developments, so it's nice that I don't have to do this off the top of my head because I run into frustrations just like you do, like or anyone does. Um, today my frustration is, like I said, my misunderstanding of what that, that inflate did and the, the thing that returned. I, I stared at that one for a little while until I finally found a good resource about that. Are there any questions about this? Okay, uh, that's all I had today. Uh, we'll see you on Thursday.